Millions of children are educated every day in a myriad of settings. Home school, public school, private school, charter schools, online academies, learning pods, private tutoring, and more. Why are so many families transitioning to homeschooling? What advantages have they found? What unique challenges do they face? What have they learned and how can listening to their experiences support your child's education? These are their stories. Together, we learn. This is The Advantage. Hello, fellow educators, and thank you for listening. I'm Todd Michael, creator and host of The Advantage. Today's guest is Saba Hashmi. Saba currently lives in a small town in Pennsylvania and homeschools her three children. Holding a master's degree in public policy and administration and formerly working with the government of Canada, her entry into homeschooling was equal parts surprising and natural. After moving to the U.S. with her husband and welcoming her first child into the world, she turned to blogging, Saba's Corner, to help herself and fellow Muslim parents navigate the complexity of parenting in the West. The journey led Saba to better understand herself and the role of parents as a child's first teacher through both Islamic and science-based perspectives. She now shares what she is learning along the way through her Instagram page, Our Homeschool Oasis. I hope you enjoy the interview. All right, Saba, welcome to The Advantage. It's great to have you on. Thank you so much, Todd. I'm so excited to be here and uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. You know, one of the things that I most appreciate about uh, your Instagram account and, and your approach to homeschooling, and, and we'll get into you know your background and, and other things, but to start off, I love that you have such a hands-on and practical approach. And what I mean by that is, if I see a post um, by you, I, within minutes, can be applying that principle or that idea with my kids. It's not often that you find accounts that really showcase what it actually looks like versus if you buy these 10 items and go to these 10 links and kind of piece together all of these complicated things, this is what it could look like, right? But it's very yeah. organic, it's very natural, and it's clearly you taking examples from your life to actually you know, show what it looks like every day. So in a moment, we'll get into to your background, but I'd like to hear just first off, what gave you the idea to, to share that? and, and did you know that you're filling kind of that unique void at the time? Um, you know, it kind of evolved. Um, my account was something different just a couple of months ago. But when I started showing these um, uh, play reels and posts, um, I was getting a lot of good feedback. And um, and the major thing that I have is the questions I ask myself is, you know, um, there's this stigma around learning where people think um, learning's a chore or it, it's not fun. School, school, nobody wants to go to school. Yeah. Um, but I have this entirely different concept of learning is exciting, it's fun, and it, you do it through play, whether you're a child or an adult. And um, the Instagram page is basically, let me show you how. And it's real life examples, practical. I mean, you're not going to really find the, you know, picture perfect over a uh, flat lays and, you know, all set up nicely. Right. It's showing you how young children play authentically. And um, in the captions, I generally share what they're learning. So parents um, can take away that stigma that maybe play is just um you know, just something you let your kids do and they're not learning anything. It's time wasting um, and all of that. Take Remove all of that and start looking at it in terms of what they're learning and what they're capable of and how they grow through play. And that's really the intention behind the account. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear what you're saying. So I'm hoping that that is really showing. Yes, uh, and, absolutely. and that's why it's not me doing it. I'm showing how the children are doing it because then you as a parent can um, see these posts and these reels and and really envision your child doing this as well, as opposed to seeing a picture perfect and product that an adult made, um, but actually seeing what it would really look like if a child did it. And so right. there's truth to that. Yes, and, and I think what's so interesting about it too is you're, because you're capturing, you know, what's innately happening with within childhood, like these moments that are child-led and are 
authentic and organic, you're also helping parents recognize the value of those moments. So it's not only like, oh, I saw this cool thing and now I'm going to try to facilitate it for my child. But you know, you, yeah. you look through enough of your posts and you start to get a sense that, wow, there's so much more learning happening than maybe I even recognized or maybe was evident or maybe I was even looking in the wrong places and all the wrong ways. And this other evidence that's being highlighted now, I can actually take joy in that and satisfaction in that and recognize that there's so many good things happening, even without me feeling like I have to be the you know, activities director for my child around the class or without even all of the, you know, purchasing all the products and making sure you have them in your home. And, and also just simple things thinking that, oh, really, there's no, you know, if a kid uses, let's say, you know, a spray bottle, they're not learning anything out of that. They're just making a mess. But in fact, (laughs) they're strengthening their hands. That's really important for when you're ready, when your child's ready to start writing. That's the stages right. that they need to go through and using that and playing um, with those things, very basic things that, you know, you have lying around in your home can really make um, the world of a difference um, as, as the children grows up. Now, I love how great of a handle you have on this and how great you apply it. But I also know that this wasn't always an area that you thought you would be an expert in or even be necessarily applying in this way in a homeschool setting. So if you, if you don't mind now, if we could back up a little, I would love to hear a little bit about how you got here and and feel free to go back as early as you want. I'd love to hear a little bit about your own education. And then I know that, you know, your, your career fascinates me. Um, and, and kind of that, that transitional time in your life where you began entertaining the idea of homeschooling and what led up to that. So, that's a big question. It's a big chunk of time. Feel free to kind of enter it however you want. Yeah, but... I was just going to say, so, uh, <laughs> you'll be listening to a lot. There's a lot to say. Yeah, I'll ask questions along the way, but I would love to, to spend yeah, some time sure. here. Yeah, so um, I'm just, you know, a regular girl born and raised in Ottawa, Canada, right? So um, I actually have Pakistani parents. So I'm first generation and um, uh, I'm also Muslim background. So my faith is Muslim. Um, and uh I was born and raised in Canada, went through the regular public education system, um, wearing different hats of being Canadian, but also, you know, have the culture, the Pakistani culture at home, but also um, uh, following Islam. And Mm -hmm. uh, from a young age, you know, I really and, and, you know, it was generally fine, but there's always that I'm just trying to fit in. Right. Uh, Because I wear all these hats, I am trying to fit in. Um, But. Um, I always wanted to, I had this aspiration, right, to be prime minister. I, I don't know why. Uh, I thought it was cool. And <laughs> It's a great entire, ambition, I have to say. <laughs> you know, aim for the stars, end up yeah. somewhere in the clouds, right? Uh, so my whole education was driven actually by that goal. So I ended up um, in, for my undergrad, doing public administration with a minor in sociology. And then mm-hmm. I did my master's in public policy and administration with a teaching certificate. And I was working in the government uh, a third year of university as a student. And then I was working full time in the summers and part time during school year. And then I was just um, hired full time after that. And I loved it. I was, you know, climbing up the ladder and um, and that was basically where my career was. And I was yeah. working in um, serious and organized crime in the financial crime unit. And it was exciting working on money laundering, counterfeit currency, proceeds of crime. Those I were bet. my files. And yeah. it was it was fun stuff. But, you know, I, I will tell you, those are files that a lot of people actually don't really like to have because they're very complex. Sure. And they're, um, I, mean, I guess they're to a degree considered victimless crimes. And to yeah. articulate them, to follow the money, you have to know legislation and policies and almost try to be ahead of the game, uh, working with all sorts of different counterparts, law enforcement, intelligence agencies, um, you name it, right? So yeah. it, was, um, it was really exciting. I, I really enjoyed that. So you can think, you know, nobody wants to really just leave that kind of a job. Um, especially when you're the go-to right before I left government, I was uh, um, actually working with the International Monetary Fund um, on um, a review. They were doing, they came to Canada to do the review and audit of Canada's anti-money laundering and terrorism financing regime. And I was a representative of my department um, working with them alongside this. So it was a really incredible opportunity. Sure. um, Then I met my husband who's American 
and I moved, I moved to the US. And that's okay. I'm actually, I'm pretty good with change, although mm -hmm. it was a really exciting career. Um, and, you know, I was hoping to get up there. Um, I'm, I'm, I really believe that God has plans for us and he mm -hmm. provides for us and whatever is meant for us will not escape us. So um, I was, I was okay with that change. And um, then that really, but the point is, is I was mainstream, right? Like right. I was part of right. mainstream society and you got I, there through mainstream education. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I would, I'm embarrassed to say this now, but I had all those feels that non-homeschoolers have for homeschooling families. <laughs> I did those myths. Sure. I did believe those. Yeah. And I, I'm ashamed to say that now though, but, um, but yeah, like that was not, um, that's not where my life I thought was going to be ever headed. Um, I do, uh, education is really important for me. So um, I thought definitely this is, you know, public school, private school, whatever it may be, that's the route, you know, my kids will be taking and their kids and their kids after that. But um, I think everything changed once I got pregnant. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that is a very, you know, huge milestone for a mother as it is. Um, and there was a lot of reflection that was taking place because like I said, you know, I was always trying to fit in to Western society because sure. I was um, a Muslim. I was, even though I was born and raised in Canada because I um, was all, I had a Pakistani culture as well. I was always still different to mm -hmm. a degree. Right. And, um, and uh, basically I, I changed my mindset because I was always trying to fit into mainstream society. When I changed that mindset to how does Western society fit with my morals and values, that's when a lot started to change for me mentally mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, trying to decide and trying to approach parenting in a way where it was um, good for our children so they don't grow up confused on who they are um, and they have answers and uh, they have confidence in that as right. opposed to always trying to fit in and um, uh, you know maybe compromising their own values and morals just to be seen with everybody else and um, that's when I started a blog um, uh, because I took basically the skills that I had from my career and mm -hmm. started putting it into research. And uh, the, the two avenues I come at it is uh, what does Islam say about, and it's predominantly parenting. So what does Islam say about parenting? Mm -hmm. And what does Western science say about parenting? And consistently what I was finding was the formative years of um, zero to seven of a child are the foundational years. And they're right. so significant for parents' involvement, education, and for children to focus on play. Islam encourages play from zero to seven. That's, um, you could find that anywhere. And science as well encourages play for that exact time frame. And I don't think that's yeah. a coincidence. Yeah. Um, so essentially, um, I started digging deeper. What does education mean? What does that mean for us? And it really comes, came down to, you know, I have I, the stats, the data doesn't lie. Right. Yeah. If right. you if you really dig deep, you'll find that even Western psychology, science, everything leads to the fact that the parent is the best educator for the child, mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be sitting behind desks. It shouldn't be. Um, it should be really what the child wants to do, and that you know that actually might even be sitting down behind desks and and worksheets if that's the child's need. Right. Um, but every child is different, and. In a school setting, you don't necessarily get that customization with a 25 to one ratio. It's just not possible. Yeah. So uh, we had all of this, this knowledge now from all the research we did and the data points and the, the Islamic research. And, you know, I guess the saying goes like, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but knowledge doesn't mean anything without action. Mm -hmm. So we were faced with a decision on how we want to approach this. And uh, we decided that homeschooling or, you know, homeschooling is such a bad word these days, but you know, home right. education, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> right. right. I know it's is, a, it's a loaded <laughs> term. It absolutely true. is. Um, you know, we wanted to take education in our hands. And yes. I mean, I can give you just a very basic example. 
Um, sure, you know, please. if you're in a in a public school education, you know, you're in chemistry class and you do this um, science experiment, but you know, as a child, you don't really understand what just happened. A teacher is not going to stay after class with you to do that science experiment over and over and over again until you figure it out. Uh, eventually, right. you'll figure it out, but that's not their job either. They have a life as well outside of the school system. Um, and but the only people that will likely do that with you are your parents. They will sit mm -hmm. there and probably do that science experiment over and over and find different ways to do it until you do understand. And then you can, um, you know, move forward and um, and and move forward in, in your class. Right? right. And and that's really important because as a parent, you really want to try to set the best education for your child and and when you do that it's much more focused to what your child wants uh, what your child needs and you're there to support them through that process so that's really how you know the plot twist happened sure. i can tell you that for all of my family and friends they didn't see this coming <laughs> um, so it was definitely imagine. a shocker now I, i'm curious about um you know in retrospect, you, you speak of this transition away from your career as, you know, you, you feel okay with it. And, and that's good. I think that's a great perspective to have. I'm curious if there was a time either, you know, just before you, you made this decision to, to move to the U.S. And, and some of these changes happened, or maybe in the midst of them, um, was there ever a time where you weren't okay with it or where, where you had any, you know, doubt or fear that, you know, you were leaving something behind that you would uh, regret. Absolutely. Because, um, I mean, people in Canada would know getting a job in the government is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And I was um, really into it. I was known for my work there. Um, it was really hard to leave, for sure. Um, but, and I, I had aspirations that, okay, then when I move to the U.S., I will do X, Y, Z. I, you know, I had a whole, sure. like, I was starting my career path in the U.S. already before moving here. Yeah. Um, I, I am a career-oriented person, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was really important for me. But, you know, you adapt. After I moved, you know, going through the immigration process, that gave me time to, you know, reflect. I wasn't, I wasn't really able to work at that point. So mm -hmm. as that transition happened, um, that career in Canada started becoming more and more distant and, and life was moving forward. I was entering a new chapter in my life. Right. And, um, and like I said, then you start wondering, like, what is important really? You know, what is this career really going to achieve for me at the end of the day? You know, um, it really what will it, I'm not going to be prime minister anymore. Right. So, uh, you know, what will it, what will I get out of it? Um, yeah. But, you know, you realize that the focus and the importance is family and, and that uh, building that um, was important for me. And I had my own goals for that um, with my husband, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes, yeah, I miss it. Even still, I do miss it, sure. but I don't regret it. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I definitely don't regret it because it's brought me to a different place where I'm more connected with my faith. I'm more connected with my children, and we don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. And also, you know, when you speak with elders who have the greatest wisdom, the one thing they say is to really take advantage of these days with the children and don't take them for granted. And I really do practice that. Mm -hmm. That is very important for me because it's true. Sometimes I see how did how did my daughter turn one, two, three, she's four, right? It's it's already going by really fast. Right. So um, this is my career now. These children are my career. And um, I will be there to support them as much as I can. And that's invaluable. No salary can beat that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that's really powerful for um, those who have already made similar decisions to hear. It's, it's very affirming, but it's also helpful for those who maybe, you know, still have that hesitation or, or are in the process of making a similar transition and, and they have that, that fear or that doubt and maybe don't see you know, the, the possibility of a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, something that, you know, struck me uh, a few years back when, uh, you know, we were, uh, my wife and I were talking about career decisions that I was considering and things like that. And, and she said something that really stuck with me. She said, you've helped me 
get my dream job as a mother, I want to help you have whatever your dream job is. And I had always known that being a mother and, and you know spending time full time with her children was a priority for her. But when she worded it that way, it really reframed the idea of, of being a, a full time mom. And that's not to say that those who balance you know work life and home life are failing or doing something wrong. But um, to have that mindset or to have that appreciation for just as you say, you know, these fleeting moments that you get to spend with your kids and to maximize that that time each day while they're young. Um, there's so much to be said for that. And I see so many women who have made that choice gain that that, you know, feeling of fulfillment and that that peace that I think that situation and very few other situations can bring. It's very unique to those early years of raising kids and and being such an important adult in their lives. Um, I would love to hear a little more about um, how play became, you know, you've, you talked about the research and, and um, you know, how it's highlighted in so many different places. How do you think, um, or what are some of the most, the biggest misconceptions that, that you see about play? Like what, what are people, we know that it is valuable, but what are people not understanding about it or maybe how are they going about it in ways that are less helpful for their children? I think the major thing is, is um, they don't, a lot of people don't really understand uh, the connection you build with your child when a parent is involved in play. And I know oftentimes mainstream society or just, you know, uh, it'll say uh, you shouldn't be so actively engaged or you'll become a helicopter parent or, you know, they put <laughs> right. all these labels and terms onto it. But playing with your children mm -hmm. does not necessarily mean you're making them dependent. If your right. child is leading the play, you're just being part of the play. But yeah. they're the ones doing the learning and you're just um, you're just the observer if you take it in that route. And there's so many different ways to play. I think and that and I think I mentioned this just earlier where, you know, you can you just think that letting your kids go to the park is play. That's a form of play, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of different categories of play. You can, you right. can do sensory play, manipulative play. You can do um, uh, uh, pretend play. You can do physical play. You can, uh, there's, play is, and is, is not bound to just one, one thing. There's a lot of uh, play could even be a child uh, doing worksheets. Play could be a child cooking. It's mm -hmm. really, what the child find, finds enjoyment in. And, right. and this is the thing is we've sucked out the fun in learning. And that's why when people say, people see the word learning and play separately, but they are not separate. Right. And I think that's the biggest misconception. When you are playing, even as an adult, you should be playing. And playing could be putting a um, computer together, building the car, yeah. or even um, sewing. Like, Play could be anything you find enjoyment in because you're learning in those moments and you're growing and uh, you're trying new things, you're problem solving. Those are all the life skills that you need growing up. It's not, you're not going to remember what happened in history class, uh, but you right. are going to remember what you did with your hands, what you did, um, what type of pretend play uh, you did growing up. I mean, all of my memories are of when I was, basically I lived outside. Right? I was yeah. playing outside yeah. all the time. And those are my memories. I don't remember what I was being taught in school. I don't, I remember when my parents played with mm -hmm. me when we were building snow igloos or um, playing with dolls. I, I remember that. Yeah. And um, you learn empathy through that. There's a lot of, um, a lot of skill sets that actually you need in this world that you learn through doing things yourself outside of a school setting. And actually those are the things that help you excel in the world and um you know for some reason it's all being shown backwards when um people are promoting public education and uh hating on homeschooling right yeah the life skills is such an important layer and i think that um all too often you know we we forget that those those moments of play and of learning are what we see when we get out of the way and let kids do their thing. You you see these, um, I'm not sure quite how to categorize them. I'll do my best to describe them, and I'm sure there's a word for that, what they are. But 
it's kind of like a museum, but it's built around play, right? And so it's several interactive exhibits. It's mostly built for kids to explore and discover. And, um, you know, they'll have different names depending on what city you're in, but they're all roughly the same type of thing. They'll have some interacting with, you know, different science experiments and, and different building and different climbing and different things like that. And you set a kid loose in that type of an environment. And you really don't have to do a whole lot during the time that they're there to direct their learning. They are motivated, they are engaged, and they are loving it. And they're connected with what they're learning, they're endlessly curious, and as soon as they have had their fill of one area or one thing, they are not fatigued, they don't need a break, they are not asking to go get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, they're on to the next learning activity. And they're learning, and they're learning, and they're learning, and they're learning. And in, in many cases, if you're willing to let them stay for hours. And I compare that yeah. with these environments that we've created that are, we call learning spaces that are public classrooms. And you see almost none of those same characteristics. There's, there's not opportunity for free exploration. There's very little encouragement to interact with the environment around you unless you're specifically directed to in a very specific way at a very specific time. There's so little opportunity for the child to lead any of the activities. It's almost always adult-led. And there's really not a whole lot of science, technology, like physical sciences, any of that represented unless you're talking about it or reading about it. But as far as seeing it demonstrated, there's so little time set aside for that. And so it boggles my mind, just as you said, you know, we we create this association of, well, learning looks this certain way. And if your kid's just home all day playing or interacting, how are we going to prove that they've learned? And, you know, how do you prove at the end of two hours of a kid at a place like that, that they've learned? Well, because you see all these wonderful things that they've interacted with and these new questions they have and this whole new understanding that they have about all the things they interacted with. It's the same with homeschooling. You get out of the way, you set them loose and you observe and you start to notice all of these wonderful things, including, and as I know you've mentioned this on your, on your page, their learning style. And so you start to see their preferences come through and things that, that they value if you just mm -hmm. get out of the way. And I think that's, I mean, you make a really good point. And, uh, and that's the thing is when you, the irony here is that um, the one top myth I think about homeschooling is, and I believed this too before, was that, <laughs> oh, but you know, your kids are never going to be social. How are they going to be social? And when I, when you stop for a moment to reflect, you're not really social at school except for recess, which is maybe a half an hour. You're <laughs> right. not allowed to talk in yep. school. Actually, you get in trouble or you get a detention, you get sent to the office or you get yep. kicked out of the room. You get disciplined. <laughs> you know, right. you actually don't get to be social when you want to be social. You're forced to be social when um, when it's recess time. But what if at that moment you don't want to be right? Right. So it's um, it, it really takes away from uh, from the child's confidence in in socializing or I mean, that's just one topic. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, once you get out of the way, children problem solve on their own. And let me just give you a, an example that's coming to mind is mm -hmm. uh, so actually. So like I had mentioned that my parents are Pakistani and we were born speaking Urdu, which is the language and mm -hmm. English. So I'm fluent and what was really important for me is that my parents sacrificed a lot to hold on to our language and our culture um, to so that we can grow up um, holding those values that they hold as well from from back home. Sure. You know, I've only been to my I've only been to Pakistan once, so I, I can't necessarily say I I am really in tune with the culture there. It's a bit of a Canadianized or Westernized way of um, incorporating that culture into my life. But what mm -hmm. was really important for me was the language, because I know that was really hard to instill into us. And I didn't want to lose that. Sure. So I actually have raised my children to speak Urdu as their first language. And at the age of two is when I start to introduce English. So my children fluently speak Urdu. And now they're um, two of them are are starting to learn English. But wow. um, the reason why I bring this up is when we go to the library, 
you know, it's it's really nice how young children, they just kind of come together and start playing. Um, sure. Uh, you know, you don't need to, they don't really care about, oh, I shouldn't talk to that person or I should. They just start playing right. with each other, right? Sure. But my daughter at the time, she wasn't speaking English. So she was not so confident in talking, but they were finding ways to interact. Mm -hmm. The children, um, they're so innocent in, at that age and they have such a clean slate, but they are navigating speaking to each other um, through parallel play or even through giving blocks and sharing or um, trying to build something together in mm -hmm. ways that they knew how to. And right. that in itself is a huge learning moment because if we were to go to, let's say, a country that we don't know the language there and we're trying to interact, we're like pointing or we're trying to, you know, use hand gestures, it's the same type of thing. But for some reason, children are able to do it a little bit better than us, I find. When I was <laughs> watching them inter interact, it was like they just, they knew what they wanted to do. They got each other and... Um, one was speaking in Urdu, one speaking in English, but they figured it out. They figured right. it out. Um, and that's the major thing is they adapt and they learn how to work together. And we don't give enough credit to that. But, you know, if I were to put my child in school, they would be sending her to ESL. And Absolutely. she wouldn't even have that. Um, they wouldn't have that interaction. And now without any of that structure, my daughter now, so this is like, you know, a year ago, she's now speaking English. And she's yeah. getting better and better at it every day. And she didn't have to go anywhere else for that, except we're just learning it and picking it up through interaction as she started talking to people. And that's all social. Right. And that's happening all outside of the school setting. Right. Yeah, I, I, I often refer to these as the non googleable skills. So there's, you know, these bits of information that we associate with school, like you need to memorize all the state capitals or you need to, you know, learn the the periodic table of, of the elements or whatever it is. And if those are good, like rote memorization has its place, yeah, of course. For sure. However, for sure. in the hierarchy of, of, you know, mental processes, rote memorization is the lowest as far as the, the complexity that it takes. And so mm -hmm. we we kind of hold it up as the highest level of learning. Oh, you memorize this. You're so intelligent. You know, we, mm -hmm. we see these Jeopardy all-stars and we're like, wow, they're so brilliant. They've memorized all this information. When really rote memorization is one of the lowest uh, capabilities. But then there's also these non-Googleable skills, which are things that, you know, if, if I get stuck and I don't know, you know, the, the square root of 64, <laughs> whatever it is that mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember, I can Google that. And I'm not saying that you should never teach or expose your kids to that. But if I get stuck, I can Google that. However, if I'm at the grocery store and someone bumps into my cart and my only instinct has ever been to, you know, immediately get mad at them and blame them for bumping into my cart, there's nothing I can look up on my phone that will help me navigate that situation. Right. That, that ability to navigate that with grace and with some type of social... Uh, you know, competency had to come from experience after experience after experience of having another kid bump into me. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the first few times I did yell at them or I pushed them yeah. back. Mm -hmm. But then I learned through experience and through guided play and through having adults in my life teach me and help me. Oh, there's better ways to deal with this. Or, you know, Absolutely. when you do flip out at them, you don't feel very good after. And so try these other ways. And yeah. a lot of times, you know, you see especially and I and I don't mean to point fingers but especially adults who themselves have gone through a public school system mm -hmm. it's hard for them to even fathom that those are innate in kids and that you don't have mm -hmm. to structure and teach them and, and reverse engineer them like I have to teach my kid to be nice I have to, it's like actually your kid came out really reasonable you yeah. just have to not put them in environments where these kind of negative instincts start to get you know uh, behaviors start to be patterned and, and they start to follow the examples of others and then they learn the bad behavior through peer pressure. If you just preserve that goodness, they're going to be able to navigate a lot of things really well. It's just, again, you kind of have to get out of the way and let them preserve that divergent thinking, preserve that goodness on their own. Yeah, and I I completely agree with that. And, and I find that in putting... Um... And, and me, having gone through the public system, I get it. I've been there. And uh, you don't have time to 
uh, nurture that uh, way of thinking or even establish that etiquette because mm -hmm. you're so busy trying to study and do good on the test because you want to pass or you want to be top in class and you don't want to be um, you don't want to fail and and those are the goals that you actually have it's right. not about you don't actually care to be nice um, that's not what you're getting graded on yeah right um but and and that's what's unfair about the system and i think it's a you know it's a, a larger issue that i don't know if it'll ever change but but we can right and that's right. the thing is we have control on really just um our small family right. and um and we can we can nurture that and essentially you know if you look back into education if i think about like what have i learned from doing my undergrad and masters you know and my teaching certificate and all these courses i've done mm -hmm. you know you don't really remember what you've done <laughs> but all of that is really the what to, what skills did you learn yeah. and and i think that's the major thing is um preparing children you know giving them tools tools as in if you're stuck in a situation how will you handle that mm -hmm. uh, not interview question so you know don't tell me what you would do do right. it and show me what you would do right. right and um those are the opportunities you get at a home setting because um although people assume homeschooling means you're sitting in the home and you're schooling like really it can be far <laughs> from that like i can't right. even tell you um you know we we will go out and about we're always out either we're taking you know field trips going to museums or the aquarium or something to learn and have fun um those are the opportunities where they get to navigate that and put those um tools at work and and learn sure. skills from there and that's you don't get that in a public school because you know you may get a field trip once or twice and even then you have to stand in a line and you can only touch certain things <laughs> like right? it, yeah. it's very regimented and yeah. um, and that's really unfair you know at some point i understand like there there is a time and place for that um but not in the beginning of the child's no. life that those years really set out um the foundation because if you think about it as well and you know going further into parenting when you um uh a lot of like you know quotes and stuff like that will say you know uh, how you treat your children is your inner child from how you were treated when you were a child mm -hmm. right so when you go and look at that it comes back to that foundation it comes back to those years of zero to seven right now i I know and, and I see in, in other parents, and I've seen it in myself, you can recognize that there's a need for that play and, and to be involved even in that play. But there's also sometimes, a, you know, I, like, I don't know how to play with my child. And, and that's such a, you know, it seems like such a funny thing to say as an adult, but I think a lot of adults feel it. Like you see your kid imaginary playing and you're not quite sure how to jump in and be involved or you you know see them needing that interaction and um and i think you know maybe i don't know that there's necessarily a gendered thing i know you know objectively my wife it comes more naturally to her than it does to me i'm not going to assign yeah. that to gender but within you know a family maybe one parent is more comfortable with it than another and so for those parents who see that need who see the value of it and maybe even who see that it works for other adults in their kids life but they want to participate more what advice do you have to, to get more comfortable with it, to you know, kind of jump in and experiment and, and know that it might be messy, but what can they do to let that become a more refined skill or maybe not even more refined, but just something they're comfortable practicing more often? Yeah, um, so actually when I was doing my research on this and um, the, some of the Islamic teachings as well, um, the prophet had mentioned to be a child with your child. And mm -hmm. I think that's the the most uh, the most important thing is when your child is wanting to play with blocks or imaginary play, play be that imaginary thing they want as well. If they're being a butterfly, be a butterfly, mm -hmm. and you'll you'll see how quickly you adapt to that and how f how much fun you end up having and how lighthearted you become and and you'll even notice that stress goes away. And you really yeah. bring out your inner child because right. the child gets so excited to see that they're playing with their parents and their parents are joining in on their fun. They're being butterflies like them or an airplane or a lizard or an alligator, whatever you want sure. to be, right? Um, you take on the role that they want you to take on and, and that's just by doing. And, yeah. um, and, let, 
and you know i feel like um there's this you know there's this i guess this way this culture of you know children are young they have to listen to us and we have to you know create ourselves to be a certain way and um uh but let go of that just just let go because mm -hmm. children are looking up to you and even if you do play with them they still look up to you but now they look at you as something completely different that right. you played with them and and that's very important i see that difference when um, i start whenever i start uh, playing with my children and you know i uh, dress up with them or i um you know, we play water and don't jump in the water and you're standing on blocks and stuff like that. When we play all of <laughs> right. those games, I see them light up and how we can play for hours. Yeah, it's tiring. It does. I mean, I'm sure. older. Of course, it's going to get tiring. Um, but for a moment, that's a memory, I think, that they start to carry with them forever. They, yeah. they remember those moments. So the major thing is just to be a child with a child. That's That's probably my top advice on that. That's great advice. And, and I see it in practice. You know, it's, it's funny every, every once in a while, um, I have four kids myself and, and my wife's pregnant with our fifth. And so it's always busy in our house. But as you can imagine, and as I'm sure you see, like kids sometimes with their siblings will want to play and sometimes they won't want to play with each other. And mm, that's just sure. normal human nature. And yeah, so yeah. every once in a while, you know, there will be, you know, two of them or, or three of them who are involved in something, but there's a, an, an odd one out. And often in these instances, then my wife or I will, you know, go with that child and maybe go in another room and start playing with them or go off in another part of the room and start playing with them. And so often when that happens, if an adult, if mom or dad are involved with the kid who was, you know, just the one that was kind of being eliminated, kind of being yeah. uh, pushed out, as soon as they see that we're playing, suddenly all the kids are playing and wanting to join and Absolutely. it's that that value of like oh dad's involved well now i want yeah. to come play you know the the, mm -hmm. the tablet gets turned off or whatever they were doing oh, is like that's sure. not yeah. interesting anymore i would much rather do this and so it's important you know i think we have to really be conscientious like you say of intentionally um, joining them and coming to their world especially if we expect them to see value in coming to our world. You know, we have these conversations with our kids of like, this is, you know, the appropriate thing to do, or this is what we value as a family, or this is what's important, and this is what we believe. And all of those things are really inviting them into our world, into our mindset. But yeah. it works so much better, just as it does with other adults, if there's give and take, and you are going Absolutely. into their world and meeting meeting them there. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you know, um, Muslim beliefs and, and kind of, you know, how your faith plays into it. And I know that you have um, a, a blog and uh, kind of explain how that works, but I know you have influence with parenting and, and that approach. And I would love to hear a little more about that. I know that's not necessarily directly related to homeschooling. And yet yeah. it is because good homeschooling is good parenting. And they're really, you know, one in the same when you think about it, the difference being when you homeschool, you have more hours in the day to mm -hmm. parent. So tell yeah. us a little bit about that, please. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so again, going back to, and it is all interlinked in the sense that, you know, um, you transition into specific roles and it was through this blog that, you know, going deeper in, and getting research that led me to homeschooling as well. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so as, like I said, when I got pregnant, I was ha asking all of these questions on, you know, um, what does my faith say? And what does the, what does Western science say about, you know, specific parenting topics on how I wanna raise my, my child as a Western Muslim. And um, a lot of that uh, academic uh, research isn't necessarily so easy to find. You have to really go digging for it because um, I can now yeah. I've, I've come to a place where I'm, I don't want to compromise my values and morals. I'm no longer looking to fit in. I'm looking to see how the West can fit into my morals and values. And right. the, the best way to do that is see where there's alignment. And that's where you have positive action. And that's exactly what my blog, Sabah's Corner, it's basically navigating um, a parenthood, uh, a motherhood as a Muslim parent in the West. And mm -hmm. I cover topics of pregnancy, postpartum, language, religion and spirituality and parenting on just everyday topics that a regular um, 
person maybe born and raised in um, North America predominantly or mm -hmm. in, you know, you know, Australia, United Kingdom, like minded countries, um, but are holding on to their faith. And how can they raise children in this environment without compromising who they're who they are um, spiritually, but also understanding that their mentality is Western? Because right. we can't expect um, us to have, I, I mean, just because my parents are from Pakistan does not mean I have an Eastern mentality. I've only right. been there once. I, I don't necessarily understand the culture nor relate to it. Yeah. But I certainly relate to the Western ways because this is all I actually know. And how can I, uh, and, and it shifts away from feeling confused all the time and trying mm -hmm. to look how to fit in and getting pulled in different directions to really understanding where we align. And you, you really find um, that there is so much alignment. And just going back to the concept of play in itself, I first looked at what does play mean in Islam? What is it telling me how I should be, how I should be with my children? And that, uh, that information is there. And then when you go to what Western science says, it's the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. the, the overlap is there. So you've got the data to back up the, uh, the faith. And yeah. now, you, now you have certainty in your approach. Mm -hmm. And that's how I tackle every article that I write. It's keeping in mind the, mental, the Western mentality and understanding that you want to raise your children with um, the Islamic faith and and this is how you can do it and some things are just simple and some things are more complex and I provide um, the scripture where it says it so if anyone ever wants to go dive deeper into it they can because sometimes you just don't know where to look but I've sure. done that research for you and that um, and that was that started with me doing it for myself on my parenting mm -hmm. um, so I can really parent as um, a Western Muslim with confidence so my children can grow up that way and uh, that's what that blog is all about. And it was through that research and really digging deep and diving into specific topics that um, actually led me to uh, our homeschooling journey. That's, thank you for sharing that. And I think that's another one of the many benefits and values of, of homeschooling is that, you know, whatever one's faith is, whatever their culture is, whatever piece of of who they are that they want to instill in their children not only do they have more time more direct contact with their children to instill that in them but then it doesn't have to necessarily be at odds with all of these other beliefs that you know in school are maybe presented with a large amount of bias because whatever teacher exactly they might be you know they might have that year feel strongly about those things or you know, culturally, whatever town you live in, those things are just generally accepted. And so mm -hmm. why would you not accept those? And, you know, in, right. in the district that I worked in, um, in California, and, and where my son went for, for kindergarten until we pulled him out the following year, there were a lot of beliefs that didn't fit with, with our morals and, and with our mm -hmm. Christian beliefs as a family and, and things that we valued. Um, but because it was so common, it was really just assumed that, well, of course, everybody is okay with this. And so it's not even necessarily like uh, across the board, you know, schooling in the U.S. or not. I have friends who, you know, live in in states that are, you know, very conservative and they have a very liberal mindset and vice versa, they live in very liberal states and conservative mindset. I mean, whatever it is, you have to navigate that and, and almost daily combat it when that's the environment your kid is spending uh, time in for seven hours a day. Whereas when you homeschool, mm -hmm. it's not just the additional time to teach it, but you also eliminate that that counter culture or that counter influence. And that's not to say that you are sheltering them because that's, a, of course, the argument that comes back. Well, right. you're indoctrinating your child. You're going to you know, create an extremist child who only thinks the way you think and how dare you. But it's not that at all. What it is is I'm sharing with my child a foundation and what I value because of course that's my prerogative it's what I value yeah. and once that value system is in place and once that foundation is strong then they're prepared to go into the world to understand to interact with these other Absolutely. value systems and beliefs and nobody has to be you know kind of feeling like at six years old I'm torn between what my teacher said is true and what my mom said is true and they can't both be true, so what do I do, you know? Right, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with that. And, you know, a parents in general and all parents, this goes for every parent, they work really hard to uh, instill certain values, morally, whatever they might be that are true to them in in their homes. And when you go outside to a public or even a private school system, you're going to encounter other children who have different beliefs. Um, some are, like you said, more conservative, more liberal. It, it depends on what spectrum they're on. And the mm -hmm. children come home with all these different, uh, they're confused used but they come home with uh you know let's say they're starting to swear or they like new vocabulary sure. or you yeah. know things yeah. like that it happens. Or, um, it happens. and and you know at the end of the day society still says oh it's your upbringing your parents did a bad job <laughs> right. but, but essentially the parents are working so hard to instill specific beliefs sure. uh, because that is their job they're responsible for those children so yeah why wouldn't you do that um and everyone's values are different and you know that's respectable as well uh but you don't know what's happening outside, right? And you can't control that. And so um, then you're you are you're fighting this, um, you know, school. This is what's happening, and at home, this is what's happening. And for some reason, whatever ha whatever is happening in school is much more funner, you know. So it's right. um, you know it is it is a tough battle, and um, even. You know, I know many people who look at me and say, oh, you're doing you shouldn't be doing this. Right. But um, but that's exactly the type of stuff that I want to uh, I can't eliminate everything, but I mm -hmm. want to reduce uh, right. because I want my child to be able to make um, make their own decisions. And eventually they will go out into the world. It's not like they're sheltered from the world, um, right. but they just need to have a strong grasp of who they are um, right from the get go. And they can do that. And and you you know you exemplify it so beautifully, and I and I appreciate you sharing that piece of it because I think a lot of parents are hesitant to embrace that and to and to own it and say yes, I am intentionally indoctrinating my child with what's valuable to me, but no, it I don't expect that to last forever, and no, I'm not trying to control them. And, and you know the word indoctrination is so heavy; it's like. You say that and people immediately bristle and are like, no, that's a terrible thing. But that's what schools are doing. You know, cultural indoctrination, school is a culture and mm -hmm. everything about it and all the belief systems of whatever community we live in, they're there every single day. And, you know, if you wonder how much of an influence it has, just go to any junior high school campus and observe all the different miniature cultures within cultures and how every kid who identifies within those, you know, culture within a culture yeah. knows exactly what you're allowed to do and not do and allowed to wear and not wear and the words you Absolutely. use and yeah. don't use and the people who you're willing to sit with and not sit with and all of these things, you know, those influences are real and they're there. And so to say, well, that's okay and that's normal, but for a parent to say, well, I want to read to my child out of the scriptures that I value or I want to teach my kid the languages that that my ancestors spoke and to say that oh well that's different that's terrible <laughs> it's just laughable and, and yeah. at, at that point you just kind of have to say whatever i'm glad that you're not the one making decisions about my kid <laughs> and leave yeah, it at that well, you know what it, it's true and in the beginning it's hard to come to that um voice of confidence um, i struggled with that as well in the beginning yeah. to really defend uh, my choice because like I said, this was a plot twist. Nobody I know really believes in homeschooling. <laughs> right. um, so so we are the odd ones out. And um, it took me a while to get to a place, but you know, because I have a very analytical mind and you know, I'm mm -hmm. very good with patterns and behaviors and I, I can really link concepts together. Mm -hmm. um, when the data is presented to me in the way that it is, the, si the stats are there, even just on what homeschoolers are able to achieve and how they're seen, actually, um, if you look at the science and forget the culture uh, perception of it, mm -hmm. um, and you know the faith is telling me something, you gain this confidence to be able to speak about it. And um, it, it matters less what people think. And right. that I think just comes with time because I, I know we're going to face this um, continuously. I already see eyes roll when I talk about it, right? Like, <laughs> right. I, I, I know you, you can spot that, right? right. Um, but it's okay now. I'm okay to do that because I have the information to defend it. And I yeah. can share that, you know, yeah. like, I yeah. have no, um, I have no problem doing that. You know, it's, and one time I was having a conversation, this is a little bit of an aside, um, because everybody thinks, you know, you know, the myth that, um, 
uh, homeschool kids are weird and stuff. And sure. Yeah, sometimes, sure, why not? Why not yeah, be weird? Yeah. Right? Well, I was um, I was the weird '90s homeschool kid, yeah, so I take credit for right? that stereotype fully. Yeah. <laughs> but um, and it's funny, and that's okay, right? I mean, isn't that the yeah. point? Yeah. Isn't that the point to be a right. little bit different? Counterculture, um, sure, right? So, uh, you know, I, I was talking to someone and they were just like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, one of my they were talking about their friends and they're like, oh, they're so weird. And I was like, oh, but they went to a public school and they're so weird. <laughs> you, know? And it's, you know, you start using these comments right, where right. Then nobody really knows what to say yeah. at those points. And yeah, people might think that that's weird <laughs> and socially awkward and it might be. But you know, it, at that point, like you start being able to respond more quickly. Yeah. And it it really takes people aback because in that moment they may not have liked what I said, but they will reflect. And yes. you do reflect. And yes. even um even me looking back, even though homeschooling was never on my radar nor would I have ever considered it, um I will tell you though, if I ever wanted to have an intellectual conversation, I was going to the very few homeschoolers that I did know. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to have more mainstream of a conversation, which was about, you know, celebrities and all of that, <laughs> right. I knew who I was going to. Yes. So even with that, um, you still do feel um, deep down that there's a lot more that homeschoolers achieve without even knowing the stats. And this was before I yeah. even did the research on that um, because they spoke more eloquently. Yeah. They, um they spoke about different things that actually mattered. Uh, they read more. They, um, and and that's what I noticed. I, I can't say that's for everybody, but the people that I did know, yeah. and those were some positive, um, as positive people in my life that actually when I when I thought about homeschooling, I, I looked at them and said, well, you know, they they did something right there. Yeah, it's and it's so interesting. It's like you say, you you build up kind of this. Uh, you know, tolerance for, for the naysayers. And then it does become kind of like a game. It, it's fun. And uh, my wife just remarked to me the other day, you know, she's like, I, something I wasn't prepared for because she, she went through public school and I was homeschooled. And so mm -hmm. um, we kind of came at this pretty recently um, that where she was, you know, willing to be on board and, and agree to homeschool our kids. Initially, she was one of the, I could never homeschool our kids, just so you know. And I was like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> But, um, you know, she said the other day, she's like, I wasn't prepared for, or, or, or I'm not as used to the bias that people have. She's like, I'm still getting used to it because I'm so excited about homeschooling now and, and I believe in it so much, but I forget like that people still have that bias. And so I'll start talking about it. And then I see the looks or I hear their reactions yeah. and I'm like, oh, that's right. Like, she's like, I haven't yeah. built up that tolerance to like be so used yeah. to it. You know, she'll see me and like people will say their things and I'll just like, without skipping a beat, I'll be like, oh, really? Like, just like you're saying, like, oh, really? Yeah. Did you know that actually there were awkward kids at your high school? Yeah. Think about it. They were all over, right? <laughs> yeah. It still happens. Sure. So maybe it's just differences in temperament and not well, actually I have to say that reel of yours that you did do, I probably watched that a dozen times. It was so funny. <laughs> the reactions. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> it's so, it's so bang on though. It's just, it was Thank so you. true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was fun to put together. And it, it's it's therapeutic and it's cathartic, I think, to get together with mm -hmm. other parents and, and recognize, like, we all experience these things. And at the end of the day, like, are you making your decisions because you want everyone to agree with them? Or are you making your decisions because you have a conviction that that's what's best for your child? Yeah. And ultimately, what's best for your child is going to win every mm -hmm. time. Yeah. And if you're okay with that, if, if that's really why you're doing it, then, you know, the rest kind of just becomes a form of entertainment, dealing with, yeah. with the funny comments. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I actually am not entirely against public school. I mean, I, I truly sure. believe to each their own. You know, there's sure. different reasons why people need to do it. You know, some families, they both need, both parents need to work. Uh, there's so many different reasons, right. right? I mean, I went to the public school system. I turned out okay, but there certainly is a different mentality yeah. in, on how you see the world and how you approach life. And, um, and, and, and that's what stands out a little bit. But, uh, like it's just it, it's funny because when I started 
homeschooling and that intention was there and I started to talk about it. I think energy follows energy. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to people about it with the enthusiasm that I have and my goal is to make learning fun, you know, I'm, I'm taking away that stigma that learning is a chore and school right. sucks. Like I'm taking that away. And um, for my kids, they love to learn right now. And um, I'm striving to find ways to incorporate learning that is enjoyable. And um, as people, you know, come to our house and they see the stuff that we do, like it's, it's almost converting people. Right. <laughs> it's bad to say it. And that's not the intention. That's not sure. the intention. But I've had like several people say that they are, are considering it now because many people oh, yeah. just don't know what they don't know. When yeah. you give them and nobody's going to look for this information unless you're actually really considering it. Yeah. No one's looking at what the what the data is. No one is right. looking to see that universities are actually actively recruiting homeschoolers because they make yes. them look good. Yes. Right? Like nobody sees that because that's that's not cool information to share. <laughs> yeah, that would take people away from the public um, school system. Right, right. And, um, uh, but once that information, people start to see that and they start to see how you're doing it because everyone's watching. Uh, it really does slowly help change the image of homeschooling altogether. And um, I don't think it'll ever be changed, but, um, you know, at least in my circle. Right. So that's um, so. So that's sure. actually fascinating to see. And, and you know, you, you sell yourself a little short because you say at least in your circle, but I mean, you're online following as well, because as I started the show with your approach is so approachable and the examples that you show are so authentic that um, nobody could look at that and think, oh, I could never do that. Or I'm so intimidated by that. It's almost the reverse where you see it and you're like, oh, that's all I have to do. That looks fun. <laughs> you know, and yeah. like you want to jump in and try it. And I want to read, uh, you know, we've talked about so many great things and I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'd like for you to, you know, share your, your uh, Instagram handle and everything and anywhere else people can find you, your blog. But I just want to read a little excerpt from one of the posts that you shared um, that I think really sums up the value and the, the essence of your approach and why mm -hmm. so many can benefit. And uh, mm -hmm. this is a little bit condensed version but this is what you said. You said, instead of taking breaks from school because the child has had too much of it, the child elects to pursue it through choice, a place where we play and learn, appreciate the journey, and focus less on the result because the result is inevitable. And that just set a fire off inside of me because that is the piece that day in and day out for the decade that I was in public education got me is we were so focused on the results and on on manipulating to get the results we wanted or to improve the outcome and the results mm -hmm. that we forgot that those results are inevitable that the learning i dare you to get in the way of a child learning put them in the dullest driest environment and they Absolutely. will find ways to interact with it that are innovative that are creating new pathways that are exciting and interesting to them. Mm -hmm. And so your highlighting of the power of play and the way that that can be transformational to recognize the value of play um, is so great and so important because then it's not, well, how do I get them doing all of these other things that I've structured and the play is a distraction? It really does become the play is the end, but it also is the means to the end that I originally Absolutely. wanted if I yeah. let it happen enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, please... I guess to add to, I yeah, guess to, add to that just a little bit, um, uh, I think uh, another misconception about play, like you're saying, it's, it's, it's not just uh, you let your kid do um, things that are maybe uh, meaningless, but you're actually as a parent, very hyper aware of your child. And right. in that, you know, you're you're really listening to what they're looking for, what they want, what their curiosities are. And as a parent, um, you try your best to set that environment up for that. You know, if um, your child wants to learn about, I don't know, jellyfish, you know, you know, try to find ways to incorporate that into their learning because they're show they're expressing um, a curiosity 
uh, mm-hmm. an interest and there's a lot of growth that happens in those and it's really about listening to hear and not just listening to respond or to ignore uh, you're really hearing your child because they actually tell you what they want and and that's really what we actively do and a lot of um, the activities that we're doing that you see on um, on my page are entirely led through the children with their ideas and I just help enable it for them and maybe take a video in the process. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's an important distinction. You're absolutely right. That inquiry originates in them. And then our role is to respond to that and, and capture that enthusiasm and incorporate the things that you know will be beneficial to them, the things that, that they you know need to need to learn. A kid's not necessarily going to just stumble upon every bit of information on their own. Yet, yeah. when you start with that inquiry, with that interest, yeah. with that enthusiasm, the motivation to continue that learning is there. They will, they will consider It'll the science it. behind it. Yeah. yeah, they will consider sure. the mathematics of it. They will be excited to learn to read the books about it, even if the books yeah. are books that are a little above their current reading level, because sure. now they're motivated to get more and more and more of it. Yeah. Whereas mm-hmm. if you said, no, I know you want to learn about dinosaurs right now, but this standard says that when you're this age, I have to tell you about this totally unrelated thing. So we're going to ignore dinosaurs and talk about that. Yeah. That's like yeah, the absolutely. fastest way yeah. to kill that enthusiasm because now right, they're just right. daydreaming dinosaurs while you're talking about the weather or right. whatever it is. Absolutely, absolutely. And and there's more retention that way as well, right? Children sure. keep that information longer and they hold on to it. You know, a year ago, we talked about jellyfish at home and, and my uh, daughter still tells me that box jellyfish have 24 eyes and <laughs> like I mean I I wouldn't have remembered that but because she keeps telling me I do remember it right. um, but it's because it was very it was initiated and and that was interesting to her and uh, it's just fascinating to see what type of information children hold on to so for those listening where where can they find you um, and and how can they you know, dig deeper in, in these things that, that you're highlighting because it's it's so valuable and it's it's great that you're shining a spotlight on and I think a lot of us um, miss those those gems, those opportunities, those moments that yeah. when you highlight them we can really start to appreciate and then hopefully get out of the way and facilitate more of them. Yeah. Um, so on Instagram, I share our journey about learning through play and my handle is our homeschool oasis. And um, it's really for not just homeschooling families, but any parent that really wants to incorporate a play in their child's daily routines um, right. and really understand what they're doing um, and what the child is learning through the process so they can feel confident as well um, as parents to know that their child is learning through every activity that they're doing. And that's targeted you know, for toddlers, preschools, kindergarten age. Mm-hmm. And um, you'll basically see of my children doing um, all the activities because um, then you can visualize the, your child doing it. And that's the main right. point of it. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, for um, for parents um, wanting to learn, uh, learn more as well, my blog, Sebas Corner, is just www.sebascorner.com. And on in there, I talk about um, parenting and as a Muslim, uh, motherhood as a Muslim parent in the West. And um, Really, there's a lot of topics that cover non-Muslim um, parenting as well. Uh, because, oh, I imagine, yeah. like I said, um, we still carry the Western mentality. And I have a lot of uh, uh, subscribers to the blog that aren't even Muslim because they still are learning a lot of information because it's evidence-based. So right. there's a lot um, in there as well if anyone's interested in um, taking a look at that. That's fantastic. Well, Saba, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I feel like I learned so much, but I also am energized. Like I love, like you say, that energy and that enthusiasm is contagious and and you have it and you speak so eloquently about it and and it's inspiring. Thank you not only for coming on the show, but I love the way that you have chosen to dedicate your time and your life to homeschooling. It's a a lifestyle that doesn't get a lot of glamour and, and in many corners of of society it even is looked down upon and yet to your children there's nothing that you could be doing that could be more valuable and so thank you for that thank you for sharing that journey along the way and thank you for representing to all of us what that power of play can look like and how 
each of us can bring that into our own child's lives and, and allow them to experience that. And now we go into that world and participate with them so that we're both benefited. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Holly. I really appreciate being here as well. And I'm, I'm really happy that we connected and you're doing great stuff as well. That was Saba Hashmi, homeschool mom, devoted Muslim, parenting blogger, and former Canadian government sleuth who now wouldn't trade playing with her kids for anything, even being prime minister. If you like what you heard today, please take a moment to give our podcast a positive rating and review to grow our audience, and be sure to share it with the other parents and educators in your life. We are stronger when we learn from one another. If you want to become a better homeschool educator, head over to homeschooladvantage.com and check out our free resources or consider becoming a member to unlock your access to the most comprehensive training available for homeschool parents. You can join the conversation by connecting with me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Todd K. Michael, Facebook and YouTube, Homeschool Advantage, and at homeschooladvantage.com. That's homeschooledvantage with an e dot com. Links to all in the show notes. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody.